Hello and welcome to another lecture from my class, PSYC 440-640, the class that's called Experimental Methods but is really more of a class about univariate data analytic techniques from a model comparisons perspective. And as you know by now, uh, I like to begin with a web comic, usually from phdcomics.com, and this one is an absolute classic, at least for me and for this class. It's um, a take on ANOVA, except instead of analysis of variance, it's analysis of value. And um, I won't read through all of it, but if you pause the video and read through the text, if you know even a small bit about the history and the current use of ANOVA, you'll find it probably as funny as I do. So uh, it's great. And the webcomic series is great, as I'm sure I've said before. So if you're not already following it, you really should be. Anyway, the webcomic's appropriate because today uh, I'm going to give a lecture just called Introduction to ANOVA, and it's as simple, really, as that. I'm going to introduce ANOVA, but before I get there, I am going to take a bit of a digression and talk about family-wise error rates. So that's the part of this lecture that may be a little bit challenging, um, hopefully not, but a little bit, and I'll do my best to kind of walk through um, why ANOVA is used, how it's sometimes uh, misused or misunderstood, and one of the major problems that we sometimes have to deal with in situations where we're using ANOVA, that is the inflation of type 1 error rate across a group or family of tests that we use to evaluate a hypothesis. Okay, so let's get going with the introduction to ANOVA. We almost certainly know already that ANOVA is an acronym that stands for Analysis of Variance. It's an uh, analytic technique developed originally by R.A. Fisher, and it's commonly used in situations where we have a predictor variable, sometimes called a factor, that is categorical in nature, and is categorical in nature in the sense of having two or more different discrete levels. Now, I suppose in situations where you had a categorical predictor variable with only two levels, like treatment group, control group, or um, you know, something like that, you know, drug A, drug B, you could use a t-test, but in situations where you have uh, two or more, especially three or more levels, you have to do an ANOVA because you're dealing with a categorical predictor variable. Now there are different types of ANOVA. We're really focusing in this unit on independent ANOVAs, or when we get a little bit more complicated, we're sometimes called independent factorial designs. The basic and important point here is that these are designs in which um, participants are in different groups and there's no overlap between those groups. So if you're a participant who gets drug A, you get you know level one of the predictor variable, you don't get drug B, which might be arbitrarily called level two. Um, or if you're in the control group, you're not also in the treatment group. Or if your gender is male, it is not also female. These are, you know, they're common situations where this happens. And in those situations where membership or assignment to levels of predictor variables are independent, we call the analyses uh, independent analyses and independent ANOVA. Now there are other situations, other designs, in which membership in different groups is not independent, it is dependent, or we sometimes call these groups conditions. So you might have a situation where participants in your laboratory undergo a particular emotional manipulation in one phase of the study, and then in another phase of the study those same participants undergo a different uh, emotional manipulation. Now it's the same people under two different conditions, uh, and we might want to compare those, uh, you know, people's responses across those two different conditions. Or there might be a clinical trial where across a period of many weeks, the same clients at the clinic receive you know, drug A, then drug B, and then later on drug C. Or maybe the order is randomized across participants, but essentially all participants get the same treatments. Um, in those cases, those are dependent designs, and they require us to use a different set of analytic techniques, uh, dependent ANOVAs, or we sometimes call them <clears throat> repeated measures, ANOVAs, and the like. Now, I'm not really going to talk about those too much in this unit, unit three of my class. I'll be talking a lot about them in, in unit four, which is coming up. So let's consider a rather uh, generic example of an independent ANOVA or independent factorial design. 
Imagine that you're an experimental um, or an experimental clinical pharmacologist. You're studying a new drug. You have a predictor variable, which is level of drug uh, dosing. You know, there are you know, placebo dose, low dose, high dose, or low dose, medium dose, high dose, and so on. And then some sort of continuous outcome variable, like a measure of the drug's effect or the measure of the drug's side effects. Now, this is just quickly important to notice. Um, as was the case in unit two, we we always have continuous outcome variables. What's different now in unit three when we consider ANOVA and factorial designs is that our predictor variables are no longer continuous as they were when we were doing regressions in unit two. They are now categorical. And as you can see in my little note here, uh, for reasons that have to do with sort of tradition and history, it's been the case that in experimental designs, predictor variables are often called independent variables, and dependent uh, um, outcome variables are often called uh, dependent variables, or sometimes variables are just called factors. Um, I'll try and be fairly consistent in my language. I like to use predictor and outcome variables because it links back or reminds us that a lot of what we're doing is essentially just a special case of regression. Now, in our example, we might have a null hypothesis that the drug that we're studying has no effect. And to put that hypothesis another way, we'd say that the predicted level of drug effect is going to be the same across all our different groups or all our different levels of our predictor variable, which is just drug. So, you know, whether you're in the placebo dose group or the low dose group or the high dose group, the null hypothesis predicts that the measured level of drug effect will be the same. If that's the null hypothesis, then obviously the alternate hypothesis is that there is some drug effect. Or put another way, there is some difference among the measured level of drug effect across our different groups or across our different levels of our predictor variable. Now that's sort of interesting, but what's probably more interesting or more important to know is which particular levels or which particular groups differ from each other. And you know, the important point I'm trying to raise here is that findings of an overall effect, that is um, rejecting a null hypothesis and accepting an alternate hypothesis, is usually not all that interesting in the context of ANOVA because usually, not always, but usually what we're really interested in is whether specific groups are, differ are different from one another. So if you're having trouble trying to visualize what this looks like, um, let's try and represent it pictographically. Again, imagine we're doing an independent ANOVA and that we have three levels of our predictor variable, drug dose. So, you know, you, each person who's in our study is either in the placebo dose group or the low dose group or the high dose group. Uh, in this design, there are at least three tests that we could do. We could, for instance, compare the placebo uh, dose to the high dose, com compare the placebo dose to the low dose, or we can compare the low dose to the high dose. So there are three pairwise comparisons, pairs just being pairs of levels of our predictor variable drug dose. Again, uh, merely of rejecting the null hypothesis that there are no differences between these groups doesn't automatically tell us which of these groups differ from which other groups. And so we often, almost always really, have to do some sort of follow-up testing. In this case, there are at least three pairwise comparisons that we could do. If we want to generalize from this point, we can use this formula here uh, to describe to us or to give us the number of different pairwise comparisons that exist for any uh, predictor variable with any given levels of treatment. In our case, we have uh, three levels of treatment and it turns out that there are three possible pairwise comparisons, but by plugging in another number, we'd get slightly different results. So if we had four different levels of treatment, you know, placebo dose, low dose, high dose, very high dose, we'd get a different number. Now, why this is important is because our group of three pairwise tests are all kind of connected together in so much as we're using them to test a hypothesis. That is the hypothesis that there are some particular differences in the effect of drug across these different levels of drug treatment. And this family has an error rate associated with it, specifically a type one error rate. That is the probability of making at least one type 1 error across a group of tests that are a family. Now for each comparison individually and in isolation we usually use the familiar 5% or 
uh, probability of a type 1 error. So, you know, you think of P less than 0.05 or the alpha level being 0.05. And if you just do some simple math, of course, if there's a 5% chance of making a type 1 error for any given test, then of course there's a 95% chance of not making a type 1 error for each individual test. But what happens if we have more than one test? Well, across three different tests, the combined probability of not making of any type 1 errors is about 0.86 and if we subtract that from 1 because the probability of making at least one error is the inverse of the probability of making no errors then we get a type 1 error rate across the family that's 0.14 or thereabouts and the important thing to notice here is that while for any one test we have our familiar and somewhat comfortable, I suppose, uh, level of alpha or type 1 error rate of 0.05. If we're grouping together a set of tests that we need to group together to fully explore a particular hypothesis, then we may unwittingly perhaps have an overall or family-wise type 1 error rate that's quite a bit larger than 0.05. And in fact, there's a formula that we can use to compute the family-wise error rate across a group of tests. And it's pretty simple here. You just take 0.95, raise it to the power of the number of comparisons or tests that you're doing, and you uh, subtract uh, that number from one, and you get the family-wise type 1 error rate. Of course, this is assuming that you want each test uh, individually to have a type 1 error rate of 0.05, as we almost always do in psychology. Now, just by plugging in some different numbers for n here, that is number of comparisons, you can see pretty uh, quickly, I think, that the type 1 error rate across the family goes up uh, rather quickly, or it grows, it goes up rather alarmingly the more tests we do. So if we had four tests that we were doing, we have an almost uh, 0.20 uh, type 1 error rate, quite a bit larger than 0.05. If we add more tests, it gets even higher. If we go back to our example, we can see that there are actually up to six different tests which we might want to do to examine differences between the different levels of treatment for our predictor variable, that is drug dose. So we have our three pairwise comparisons, but I guess if we really wanted to, we could say, well, what about the placebo dose compared to the average of the low and high dose? You know, let's see if any amount of drug is different than no drug at all. Or maybe we could compare the placebo dose group and average with the low dose group against the high dose group, saying, well, you know, is low, little or no drug any different from a lot of drug? Or, you know, I'm not really sure why we do this, but we could average the placebo and the high dose group and compare it to the low dose group. So again, there, there are six different comparisons that we could do if we wanted to, three pairwise and three grouped comparisons. So potentially, our family of tests could be quite large. Um, and uh, the reason I'm bringing that up is it, it is sometimes the case when people do research the, and they run an ANOVA to test whether a predictor variable with uh, multiple um, categorical levels has some effect on an outcome variable or is associated with some effect on an outcome variable. They start to test all the different possible comparisons, inflating or enlarging, uh, enlarging, enlarging the size of their family of tests that they're using to evaluate their alternate hypothesis. Um, uh, perhaps unwittingly increasing the family-wise error rate for their analyses, making it easier for them to find a uh, possible effect, an effect which looks like it's real but is really a type 1 error, a false positive. So again, in this example, we've got up to six members in our family of tests. The family-wise error rate is more than 0.25, so we have a more than one and a quarter chance of finding a significant effect, that's in deliberate air quotes there, even if in reality, that is in the population, there are no differences between the level of effect of any of our individual levels of uh, drug dose or combinations of those levels of drug dose. Uh, we, we're making it easier to find a false positive, even if we don't realize it, by doing more and more tests to fully evaluate the alternate hypothesis. Now here's a chance for you to try this, and you don't need any special data to do it. You can just work on this uh, you know, from your desk using a calculator or the calculator on your computer. 
Imagine that you have a predictor variable with five different levels or five different groups. You want to test all the pairwise comparisons, not any grouped or combined comparisons, just the pairwise comparisons. What would the family-wise error rate be for that uh, family of tests? Now, if you paid attention for the last few slides and if you did the little practice problem, you may be wondering yourself, to yourself, how big is a family of tests? You know, in my example, uh, I said, well, you know, you could have three pairwise comparisons, but then you could have three more comparisons if you include some of the possible combined groups comparisons. Um, how, how do you decide how big your family of test is, tests are going to be? And as a consequence, how large your family-wise type 1 error rate will be? Um, well, the answer, um, for better or for worse, is it kind of depends. And it depends a lot on the nature of the research that you're doing. I think early on in the semester I made the distinction between exploratory and confirmatory research, but in fact I'm almost certain I did. But anyway, here's a quick review. Recall that exploratory research is research that's conducted in what's sometimes called a context of discovery. This is where we're working in an area where there isn't a good uh, literature of previous findings or there aren't good well-developed theories to describe how predictive variables ought to be related to outcome variables. We're kind of just out there looking to see what what we can see. Maybe we're trying to develop a theory ourselves. In that context or in that type of research, we may not be overly concerned about type 1 errors, false positives. We may be more concerned about missing a potential effect, a type 2 error, a false negative. So in that type of context, if you're doing that type of research, you may not really care about the number of tests in your family. Uh, care how big that is your family of tests are. You might have a predictor variable that has you know six different levels and you don't really worry too much about comparing level one to two and two to three and average of one and two and three to four and five and so on and so on doing lots and lots of little tests just hunting around for some potential finding because you're doing this work in, ex in a spirit of exploration and you're reminding yourself or keeping hopefully in the back of your mind that anything that you do find could uh, be potentially a type one error that's in contrast to confirmatory research. This is research which is done in what's sometimes called the context of justification. This is where we're evaluating a particular theory that exists uh, by testing hypotheses based on that theory. We're trying to replicate an established finding in our literature. Here we are concerned about type 1 error. Here we don't want to have a false positive because that can lead us to draw the wrong conclusions about the validity of our theory or about the robustness of this particular published effect. So in this context, if you're testing a specific hypothesis based on a theory you read about or trying to replicate a published piece of work, um, you probably do care a lot or you should care a lot about the number of tests that you will need to do in order to evaluate that particular hypothesis. You care about the how big that family grows because you know that the bigger that family grows, the greater the family-wise type 1 error rate will be. And you, of course, would like to keep that family-wise error rate as low as possible. An important and related point to make here, at least for confirmatory research, is that the more specific our hypothesis is, the more specific that uh, alternate hypothesis is that we're trying to evaluate, um, the easier it is for us to define clearly our family of tests. If we have a rather vague hypothesis, like, well, there'll be some relationship between these predictors and these outcomes, then it's often hard to know ahead of time how many tests we'll need to do to fully evaluate that hypothesis. If we have a relatively focal or precise hypothesis that we're testing, then it gets a little bit easier. So here's an example. Imagine that we have some categorical predictor variable which has five different levels in it. We might make a hypothesis, we might have an alternate hypothesis, that there is some difference in our outcome variable across the levels of this predictor variable. Um, you know, something like, we predicted that the groups would differ. Uh, you might read that, or you might even hear someone say that at a conference. Well, uh, you know, that's not terrible, but it is pretty vague. It's not a very good hypothesis because it doesn't really suggest which groups will differ from which other groups or in what fashion. It's pretty uh, hard to know exactly how many tests you'll need to do before you find, uh, or I'm sorry, before you have fully evaluated that hypothesis.
It might be a little bit better if you said, or if you, your colleague said, we predict that group one will differ from group two. Well, that's actually really good. That's, that's precise. And of course, only one test is needed to evaluate that hypothesis. Of course, it doesn't get at other possible differences, but maybe group one and group two are the groups or levels of the predictor variable that you care the most about. So one focal hypothesis with one test associated with it may be all that you need. And if that's the case, then that's wonderful. That's good. You could imagine someone saying something like, we predicted that group one would differ from group two, but not from group three. Well, that's also pretty precise. And of course, you'd need two tests in your family to evaluate that hypothesis. And leaving aside the fact that one of those tests is a test of a null hypothesis, group one not differing from group three, that's still pretty good. Um, so we need two tests that's a small family. And although family-wise error rate, of course, will go up a little bit, it won't go up as much as if we did many, many, many tests. We can even get kind of tricky or, or clever about this by saying something like, you know, we might predict a decrease in our outcome variable across groups three, four, and five. Now this is pretty precise. We can actually test this prediction using a linear trend, which is just one test, and maybe even garner some additional statistical power by doing that test as a one-tailed test. So getting even more statistical power for our hypothesis testing that way. The point is that however we set up our hypotheses, it's usually better to be precise, partly because I think that communicates more to our reader or to the person we're talking to, and also because it hopefully helps us to specify how big our family of tests will be in order to evaluate that hypothesis, and reminds us to, whenever possible, keep that family size small so as to avoid kind of rampant inflation of family-wise type 1 error rate. Moving on a little bit, let's just note here that ANOVA is sometimes called an omnibus test. Now, I've used that word before, I'm probably sure, or at least I think I have in this semester, but what we mean by an omnibus test is that it's a test of an overall model, in this case an overall model about group means. Our compact model associated with our null hypothesis is that there is no difference among these means. So in the case of our example where we have three different levels of our predictor variable, our hi null hypothesis is that those means are all equal. And as I've kind of noted before, the alternate hypothesis, which is associated with the augmented model, is that all these means are not equal. And again, as I've noted before, part of the challenge here is those three means can be not equal to each other in a number of different ways. And we often care particularly about the specifics of how those different uh, means are different from each other. I'm bringing this up now because I think out there in the literature, or at least in statistics textbooks, there's sometimes this, this idea that I think is promoted that ANOVA somehow helps us to manage type 1 error when comparing different groups. So people will say, well, you know, instead of doing a number of different t-tests, what you do instead is just one ANOVA. And maybe that leaves you wondering, you know, does ANOVA actually help us to manage type 1 error rate when comparing um, groups, when doing a family of tests to compare different groups of a categorical predictor variable? Um, Sometimes, yes, it does, if we only, at a sort of a general and omnibus level, ca care whether there's any difference between any of these groups, then yeah, and ANOVA is kind of helpful because it can allow us to test the hypothesis uh, that there is, um, well, to, we can allow us to potentially reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference across the means for those different groups. But usually what we care about are relatively more specific differences. You know, does group one differ from group two? Or does group one and two differ from group three? In those cases, we almost always need to do additional testing beyond just that first kind of omnibus ANOVA. And as we do that, potentially type one error can creep upwards. In fact, you can imagine you'll, you hit do an ANOVA like the one in our, uh, in our example, and we have some sort of a significant effect, we can reject the null hypothesis. That tells us that two or more of the groups are significantly different from each other, but we wonder to ourselves, well, which ones are there, or which ones are different? In general, there are two different approaches that we could follow to evaluate which groups are different from each other. 
One is to do all of the uh, follow-up tests for all the possible comparisons, you know, all the pairwise comparisons, all the grouped comparisons, um, using hopefully some sort of post hoc testing procedure that helps us manage the obviously inflating family-wise type 1 error rate. Another approach is to be more specific and more targeted and do only follow-up comparisons that we really care about, ones that are testing relatively specific hypotheses, things that maybe allow us to use planned contrasts or trend analyses or so on. I'll talk about those things in later lectures. But um, you know, the second approach is more specific and more focused and depends of course on having a specific and focused hypothesis to guide it. If you know going in that you really care about the comparison of group 1 and 2 as compared to group 3 and 4, then you can test that relatively efficiently rather than saying, well, we just think some of these groups will differ, so let's test 1 against 2, 1 against 3, 1 against 4, 2 against 3, 3, 2 against 4, 3 against 4, and 1 against, I think I'll raise up 1 against 4, but you get the idea. Um, two broad approaches, a general and kind of uh, uh, vague approach or an approach which is suitable to vague hypotheses and a relatively specific and focused approach that is uh, useful or relevant to specific and focused hypotheses. The important idea that I'm kind of dancing around here is that a significant result from an omnibus test like an ANOVA can be informative, um, but it doesn't do anything magical by itself to protect against family-wise error rate. Um, you know, I maybe I'm overemphasizing this point, but I can remember back in grad school being told by an advisor of mine that uh, once you find a significant result with your ANOVA, you can do as many follow-up t-tests as you like because those t-tests are protected, uh, his word, from fa problems with family-wise type 1 error rate. And, and that's just not true. Um, maybe that's changed. Maybe stats textbooks and, and stats teachers are better than they used to be. I guess I hope I'm better. Um, but anyway, it's it's not true. We, we always have to do with ANOVA or really with any other type of analytic procedure is be specific in our hypotheses, planful in the number of tests that we are going to do to evaluate those hypotheses, and mindful of the error rates across those families of tests. Let's practice thinking about family-wise error rates, and this is something you can do on your own. I really do encourage it. Find an area of study, uh, I'm sorry, find a study in your area of research or your area of interest. You'll find a published piece of research um, and read the results section. Read the analyses and see if you can answer the following questions. And if you're enrolled in my class, uh, we'll try and you know go through an example or two in our next class period. First, Ask yourself, what is the nature of this piece of research that I'm reading? Is it exploratory research or is it confirmatory research? Um, does the author make it clear which it is? You know, is this exploratory research where it seems like the researcher is trying to develop a new theory or are they testing an existing and specific theory? How uh, clear is the main hypothesis or hypotheses? Is the hypothesis vague or is it precise? Can you guess from reading it how many tests will be needed to evaluate this hypothesis? Or does the researcher tell you how many tests he or she is planning to do to evaluate this particular hypothesis? Given the number of tests needed, how big is that family of tests? Um, how many tests does the researcher actually do when he or she is evaluating the particular hypothesis? What is the family-wise error rate across that group of tests? You know, you could easily compute this yourself. What's the likelihood of getting at least one false positive, even if there were no differences between uh, the means um, of the different levels of the predictor variable, if we're thinking of ANOVAs? Do the researchers do anything to control for family-wise error rates? Do they have any sets of planned contrasts to limit the number of tests that they do? Do they do post hoc corrections to limit the family-wise error rate across a group of tests or so on? The important points here are that you should be easily able to answer these questions. In a perfect world, research would be done in a systematic and clear manner and would be reported likewise. Um, it's often not that way. We don't live in that perfect world and a lot of times researchers don't really provide enough information for us to answer those questions and to me this is really frustrating because it can make it hard for me as a reader to interpret the results of research that I'm reading. To feel comfortable in understanding how much or how little 
the chance of a type 1 error rate is across a group of tests that are related to a particular hypothesis. And the research literature in many areas of psychology is replete with examples, bad examples, of this type of behavior, some of which we could call p-hacking. So for instance, researchers who are doing exploratory analyses, but then writing them up as if they were confirmatory. That is to say, sort of fishing around for differences between groups or correlations between variables, and then after finding them, finding or creating a theory that sort of explains why they would have predicted those results. Uh, uh, researcher, uh, an advisor of mine in grad school called this post hoc masquerading as a priori. That is uh, an after the fact explanation masquerading or passed off as a prediction that was set up ahead of time. Another thing that happens sometimes in the research are vague hypotheses, uh, researchers making vague hypotheses and then running a flexible number of tests to evaluate them, you know, not being really clear about the hypotheses that they're evaluating and then just running lots and lots of tests which of course can increase, or this can, will inevitably increase type 1 error rate. <clears throat> and relatedly, not managing type 1 error rate across a family of tests and then only reporting significant results that support a hypothesis. So running a lot of tests and thus uh, inflating type 1 error rate, but then only reporting the so-called significant effects, which leaves the reader with the impression that the researchers maybe only did one or two tests when in fact they did many, many, many tests and kind of capitalized, at least potentially, on inflated type 1 error rate across a very large family of tests. To be clear, these are all bad things to do, and so don't do your research like that. It's bad enough that our literature is kind of messed up with these types of problems. You and me and other people doing research now, let's not continue these traditions. Okay, now I know I'm kind of uh, a bit in the weeds at this portion of the, in the lecture. I've, I've digressed for quite a bit, and I want to hit one more point before getting back to ANOVA, so please be patient. And that interesting point or inter interesting question is, what's the difference between family-wise error rate that I've already mentioned and experiment-wise error rate? Well, family-wise and experiment-wise error rate are often used synonymously. So sometimes, well, I say often, at least sometimes they are. I've certainly read textbooks and I've seen blog posts where people will substitute one phrase, family-wise error rate, for another, experiment-wise error rate. And this is actually not correct. They mean, these two things mean different things. Family-wise error rate I've already introduced, and that's just the type 1 error rate across one family of tests. So one group of tests that are necessary to evaluate a specific hypothesis, we call them a family, and the family-wise error rate is just the probability of making at least one type 1 error across all the tests in that family. Experiment-wise error rate is the type 1 error rate across all the families of tests in a particular study. So all the tests that are done in a particular study, which may be grouped into different families, each of which is associated with a different research hypothesis. Collectively, they're called the experiment-wise grouping, and they have an experiment-wise type 1 error rate. And by the way here, experiment-wise itself is a little bit of a misnomer, because really this could apply to experimental or non-experimental research. It would be better if it was called something like study-wide type 1 error rate. So these things are slightly different. To be clear, family-wise error rate, this is something you should worry about. Almost always when researchers in psychology and other behavioral and social sciences are testing a hypothesis in order to really, or you know, evaluating a hypothesis, in order to really evaluate it, they'll have to do at least a few tests, and thus there'll be a family of tests, and thus there'll be some inflation of type 1 error rate. Researchers ought to be mindful of this, and when possible, do what they can to control and minimize this family-wise error rate. What about experiment-wise error rate? Do I have to account for every single test I run in a whole study? Like all the different tests, which may be quite a lot, do they have to worry about experiment-wise type 1 error rate? Uh, maybe, but probably not. If you're doing a study, you know, if you're doing an experiment, of course it doesn't have to be an experiment, but any, any sort of study where there are multiple hypotheses that are tested, that are being tested, the first thing you should do is group your tests into families. These are 
groups of tests which are associated with specific research hypotheses. You need to manage family-wise error rate anyway, and organizing tests into families is helpful because it kind of groups them all together. You can think about them. You can try to decide how much or how little do you need to worry about family-wise error rate. Then you can think about how closely related those groups are. If the hypotheses are all really similar, and they all evaluate the same theory, they all kind of come from the same theory. I've got one particular theory that I'm kind of working on, and I'm testing three or four hypotheses based on that theory, and the hypotheses are pretty similar, and each of those hypotheses has a set of tests associated with it. Maybe I really should kind of regroup those all into one larger group and be concerned about the error rate across all of them, all of those separate groups of families. However, if the hypotheses are fairly distinct, if you have multiple theories that are being evaluated in your study and each of those theories has one or maybe two hypotheses associated with it and each of those hypotheses has a couple tests associated with it, maybe you don't need to treat them all as one large collective and worry too much about the error rate across all of them, across the whole experiment as it were, or across the whole study. Short version of this, the TLDR or TLDL, did too long, didn't listen version is, you should think about family-wise error rate. You probably don't need to think about experiment-wise or study-wise error rate. All right, with all that done, or at least for the moment, let's get back to talking about ANOVA. Now, by this point in the semester, I've said a couple times, including once in this very lecture, that ANOVA is just a special case of regression, a special case in which the predictor variables are categorical. Um, <clears throat> for historical reasons, ANOVA and regression have been, in the past at least, taught rather differently. So if you were someone who specialized on ex in experimental work, um, kind of group comparisons work, where you have one group, a treatment group, a control group, and so on, you might have taken separate classes on ANOVA and spent most of your life thinking about ANOVA. Um, in contrast, if you were someone who did mostly non-experimental work, you know, correlational type analyses would have been the thing that you may be focused on, and maybe you didn't think much about ANOVA one way or the other. As recently as when I was in grad school, ANOVA and regression were taught in very different stats classes, uh, which was kind of weird. You know, like ANOVA would be taught in the statistics department or the psychology department, but regression-based analyses would be taught in the educational psychology department. So kind of weird, but that's the way things used to be. Um, things are different now, thanks in part to some of the writing and work of, of um, Jacob Cohen, who you can see pictured down there in the bottom. ANOVA and regression really should be taught together. I think it makes it easier for you to learn them. You know, once you've learned a bit of regression, I think it's fairly easy to start thinking about ANOVA as regression and to work with regression mod type constructions when doing your ANOVA. Um, it's also worth noting that many stats progr programs, including SPSS, in their recent uh, or relatively recent editions have emphasized the kind of the re regression based approach to analyses of categories Categorical predictor variables. So they kind of treat um, ANOVAs as regressions as well they should. And indeed, the module in SPSS that we're going to be working on a lot is called General Linear Model Module, which is just a module where you can quite flexibly do sort of regression type analyses with continuous predictor variables and ANOVA type analyses with categorical predictor variables. Now there is an older and more traditional way to teach and to do ANOVA called the variance sums method that was developed before modern computing, um, back when you really couldn't, you, you didn't have the type of equipment necessary to do multiple regression, which is the, the backbone of factorial ANOVA. Um, this technique is, is nice in that it's relatively easy to do. Uh, however, it is less flexible to do uh, than the method that I'm going to teach. And so while I will talk about it a little bit and I'm planning to do a supplemental lecture on it, um, it won't be the focus of my teaching and probably not the focus of most of what you do when you actually do your analyses. So again, getting back to our example, we have our categorical predictor variable that has three levels. There's a placebo, a low-dose group, 
and a high dose group. And we've got our outcome variable, which is continuous. And I'm using here the example from Andy Fields discovering statistics using SPSS. In that example, he uh, uses as his drug Viagra and as his outcome variable libido. Um, a lot of the examples in the Andy Field textbook are have a kind of an off color or kind of a you know sort of silly tone to them and this is an example i suppose he's trying to make statistics which, which can be quite boring and dull a little bit sexy or funny and good for him now i've said that we want to run our anova in a regression or as a regression um, now let's think about the predictor variables that go into a regression if those predictor variables are continuous, then it's really easy. This is kind of what we did in unit two. We had one continuous predictor variable in the case of uh, simple regression, two or more in the case of multiple regression. In any, uh, in any example, it was fairly easy to enter those variables into our analysis. We can also have a pretty easy time if our predictor variable is categorical but dichotomous, meaning it only has two levels, because then we can just assign one value to one level, like zero, and another value to the other level, one, and enter that one variable, you know, group, you know, treatment versus control, male versus female, into our regression analysis without too much difficulty. Now, when we're doing an ANOVA, when we have a categorical predictor variable that has more than two levels, we have a little bit of a challenge. We can't just enter uh, that variable in, as a predictor variable into our regression. We can't just recode the variable such that placebo group is equal to zero and low dose is equal to one and high dose is equal to two because regression, uh, the regression module in SPSS or in Excel will treat that variable as if it was a continuous variable, which it's not, but one which has a ridiculously small range. So the results we get won't make much sense to us. What we can do instead of that, though, instead of just uh, you know, adding or recoding our categorical predictor variable into numeric values and then entering it into the uh, analysis as one variable, what we can do instead is we can recode or represent that categorical predictor variable using sets of dichotomously coded variables. So if we think about our equation for a general linear model like this one, uh, what we can do is create variables like x sub 1 and x sub 2 and x sub 3 and x sub 4, sets of these variables that in combination represent the different levels of our categorical predictor variable. And then instead of using that categorical predictor variable in the model directly, we substitute in these code variables. Now, the number of these variables we need, since each one can only be dichotomous, depends on the number of levels of our predictor variable. And it's very simple. There's always going to be one less than the number of levels of our predictor variable. In the case of this example that we've been working through, there are three levels of our categorical predictor variable, placebo, low dose, and high dose. That's three minus one is two. We know we need two coding variables to fully represent that uh, predictor variable. So we need two categorical predictor variables to serve as our, our coding variables, and we're going to choose ones that can have values of only zero or one assigned to them. This is called dummy coding, and I'll be talking a lot about dummy, dummy coding in this lecture and in following lectures. But as you can see here in the little table, what I've done is I've got my two coding variables, my dummy coding variables, and for each level of my categorical predictor variable, I'm using those dummy codes to create unique codes for those levels. So 0, 0 is my code for the placebo dose, 0, 1 is my code for the low dose, and 1, 0 is my code for the high dose. The important thing to note here, if it's not obvious, is that I've chosen my comparison group, that is, the group that I'm going to be using to compare my other groups to, encoding it 0, 0, and I'm taking my other groups and I'm coding them with combinations of 0 and 1. 
So the important point here to note is that in dummy coding, there's going to be one group or one level of our predictor variable that all the others are going to be compared to. And that group is going to be the one that gets the code variable values of zero, 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 however many dummy code variables you have. Now, if possible, a uh, use the, that coding, that all zeros coding for the level of the categorical predictor variable that makes the most sense as the natural comparison. In the case of a drug study, this might be the placebo dose group or the no dose group, or in the case of a psychotherapy study, this might be the group of people who are on the wait list, so they're not receiving any psychotherapy. Or in the case of an experimental uh, laboratory experimental design, this might be the group of people who don't get any uh, manipulation. They're, they're they don't see any emotional stimuli or get any sort of cognitive task, whatever. Um, sometimes, often in independent uh, designs, there will be that one group that is the control group or the comparison group, and it'll make easy sense for you to assign people in that group to have values of zero, 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 however many code variables there, there are, um, and take advantage of the fact that later on you'll be comparing all the other groups back to that group. So imagine uh, you're trying to do this. Imagine you're trying to make dummy codes for a categorical predictor variable that has five different groups. How many dummy code variables will you need? And once you've determined that, sketch out the codes on a piece of paper or um, in the little notepad app on your, on your tablet or your computer or whatever else. Just practice this. It should be fairly easy, but if you're struggling, pause, go back and look at how I've done it for our example in this lecture, make sure you understand what to do. In the case of our current example, here are the dummy code variables. We only need two of them for three levels of our categorical predictor, and here are the code values that uh, it makes the most sense for us to use. Um, zero, zero, of course, for placebo, and the other possibilities for low dose and high dose. And to be clear, if it's not already clear, it doesn't matter um, or it's not necessary that low dose is zero, 01 and the high dose is 10. We could easily have reversed those codings. It'll have some consequences for how we interpret the regression coefficients of our analyses. I'll get to that a little bit later. But it isn't necessarily the case that um, low dose had to be zero, 01 and high dose had to be 10. Again, it could easily be the other way around. Um, by the way, if you're in my class, you can uh, download an Excel spreadsheet where I work through some examples uh, using this coding scheme. If you're not in my class, of course, you can just copy this from the uh, screen here. There are only 15 people uh, in this uh, entirely fictitious uh, data set. So if you're looking at my Excel spreadsheet, you can see that the approach I'm taking is the same model comparisons approach that I've taken for all the examples throughout the semester. I've got a compact model. That's a model that doesn't have any information about our predictor variable, the uh, group membership, the dose that people get of the drug. I've got an augmented model that does have that information. You can see the regression coefficients for those two models there. You can also see that I've used the linest function in Excel to get those regression coefficients for my augmented model. And once I've got those values, I can compute predicted uh, predictions for the compact model and the augmented model. I can look at the error reduced, the error within each of those models, and I can basically create an ANOVA table just like I did with any other regression that we've done, uh, that we've done in Unit 2 or previously in this class. And in this particular case, we can see that the omnibus test or the omnibus effect is significant. That is, the augmented model, the model that includes information about group membership, that is, whether you're in one dose group or another, explains significantly more variance uh, than a compact model, which does not. But as I said before, just simply noticing or you know, observing, I guess I should say, a significant overall or omnibus effect is often not all that interesting. What we're probably more interested in is which particular groups differ from each other, and hopefully we have some specific hypotheses about that.
low dose group will differ from placebo dose group. Placebo dose group will differ from high dose group. Low dose group will differ from high dose group. In this particular example, I haven't been particularly clear about what my hypotheses are, but you could imagine that if you were doing this for real, you would have some fairly specific uh, hypotheses that you would want to test. Here's where things get interesting. When dummy coded variables are used, the regression coefficients that we get from our analyses can be e interpreted. They have meaning. They're either going to be group means or contrasts between group means. So for example, the intercept of the augmented model, that's the prediction that the model makes when the predictor variables are all zero. In the case of our dummy coding scheme, the dummy coding scheme zero zero corresponds to the placebo dose group. So the augmented model's intercept is going to be the mean for the placebo dose group. And sure enough, you can see here that the intercept for the augmented model corresponds to the mean of the placebo dose group. I've got it labeled there over on the side for, for clarity. B sub 1 for model A is going to be the comparison or the contrast between the placebo dose group and the group that has won for the first dummy coded variable. The group that has won for that dummy code variable number one happens to be the high dose group. So B sub one is going to be the contrast or the comparison between the mean for the placebo dose group and the mean for the high dose group. And again, if you look down here at B sub 1 in my augmented model, you can see it's quite simply the difference between the mean of the high dose group and the mean of the placebo dose group. And just to finish this off then, we can see that B sub 2 in the augmented model is going to be the difference or the contrast between the group that got 0, 0 for its coding, the placebo dose group, and the group that got 0, 1 for its coding, that is the low dose group. And so once again, if we take a look at B sub 2 in our augmented model, you can see that it's just simply the difference between the means for that placebo dose group and that low dose group. If we put this all together, we can see that in a regression model, uh, in an augmented model uh, that has used dummy coded variables, those regression coefficients B sub 0, B sub 1, and B sub 2 have specific meanings, and those meanings are probably kind of interesting to us, especially B sub 1 and B sub 2, because they give us contrasts or comparisons that we probably care about. Also, it's just interesting to know, and this is just a, a little side point, that the intercept for the compact model is going to be equal to the mean for all the data. Because again, the compact model is the model that ignores group membership or contains no information about group membership. So it's like if I said, here's a particular person in my sample, could you guess his or her level on the outcome variable? Uh, but I'm not going to tell you which group they're in. I'm not going to tell you if they're in the low dose, placebo dose, or high dose group. Your best guess would just be the overall sample mean. That is, in fact, the prediction that the compact model makes. The overall sample mean, uh, which you can see is equal to, well, in fact, the sample mean. Um, and also you can see here that B sub 1 and B sub 2 in the compact model are zero, again, because this uh, model doesn't include any information about group membership. There are no contrasts in this model. It's just the overall sample mean. So at the risk of belaboring this, I'll say the important point here is that when dummy coded variables like the ones that we have made in this example are used, regression coefficients can be fairly easily interpreted as either group means or contrasts between group means. If you need any further persuasion of this or if you just like to think about things visually, here's a nice graphic that comes from Andy Field's textbook, Discovering Statistics Using SPSS, and you can see here how he's shown that B sub 1 and B sub 2 are quite literally the contrast between the averages of these various groups, as you can see here. Here's an interesting point. When dummy coded variables are used, it's actually pretty easy to come up with those coefficients for model A. We just need to think about how the coding was accomplished. So again, here is the coding that we've used. I've just highlighted the different groups in different colors. 
normally when I run an analysis in Excel and I'm doing a multiple regression, so I'm doing a regression that has more than one predictor variable, in this case those predictor variables are these dummy coded variables, I just take advantage of the linest function and that gives me those coefficients. You can see here they're in the bottom row, I've just kind of copied them into the column and labeled them so that it's a little bit easier for me to recognize what they are. Now linest, of course, works really easily. It's an array function, so you have to get comfortable with pressing shift enter when you when you uh, compute the function, but it's not hard to do. And it's necessary if your predictor variables are continuous predictor variables, as they were in the examples of multiple regression in unit two. However, in this unit, at least for simple cases of one-way ANOVA, ANOVAs with one predictor variable, it's easy just to eyeball the different means for the different groups and think about the coding scheme and come up with those values just you know, by doing some simple arithmetic. I can know right away that the um, value for B sub zero is going to be the mean of the group that got the zero zero code, that's my placebo dose group. I can look to see that B sub 1 is going to be my contrast between the placebo dose group and the high dose group, so I can just do the math to create the difference there. And likewise, I can see that the um, that B sub 2 is just going to be the contrast between the placebo dose group and the um, low dose group. And so again, I can just do the math, uh, the arithmetic there to create that difference and enter it in. Here's another interesting point. As you already know, Excel has a plugin that you can that you can install, which is the Data Analysis Tool Pack. It has a lot of different tools that you can use for well data analysis, and it allows you to do ANOVA type analyses in a couple different ways. You can run it uh, run these analyses as regressions, or you can run them in a more traditional ANOVA type way. So here's just a screenshot of me, uh, of the output when I ran a regression analysis using the regression tool in the data analysis toolkit. And you can see here, I've got some output. Um, it has the naming conventions uh, for the different parts of the ANOVA table, which are typical when we do a regression analysis, so regression, residual, total. And it gives me things like uh, t-tests and p-values and confidence intervals for um, my regression coefficients, and that's kind of that's kind of handy to see. Here is the output for um, of my analysis when I did my ANOVA as a more traditional ANOVA. The only trick here is you can kind of see this at the top of the uh, screen capture. There, I had to rearrange my data into a different format where my variable, um, my predictor variable is represented in different columns. I've got all the people in the placebo dose group in one column, all the people in the low dose group in another, all the people in the high dose group in the third. Once I've got the data entered that way, it's easy for me to open up the data analysis toolkit, select ANOVA, and run an ANOVA on that data. The results I get are essentially the same. Uh, notice, however, that there's a little bit less information because I don't get those nice regression coefficients, which can be interpreted as I've described before. Also notice, kind of interestingly, that the naming conventions are a little bit different. The ANOVA table for an ANOVA analysis uses the naming of between group, within group, and total instead of regression residual and total, but essentially the numbers we get are the same. So, you know, my point here isn't just to kind of go on and on about Excel. It's just to note that Excel is useful. It's got some interesting tools in its tool pack. Uh, personally, I prefer doing my analyses by hand. Uh, and by that, I mean, I like to set up my dummy codes myself. I like to create my compact model and augmented model myself and just kind of make Excel do the math for me. Um, the reason I like that is it helps me to learn how these analyses work. Also, these analyses are dynamic, meaning if I go back and change values in my data set, like if I delete a particular case or I realize that one of my cases had some bad data and I recode it, then all my analyses update. The data analysis tool pack gives you static output, which is always just going to be the same. If you change the data, delete the data, your output won't change, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It, it's just, well, it's just a thing. Uh, I prefer the more dynamic analyses because it's easier for me to make changes when changes are appropriate. All right, are you getting confused at this point? I mean, I know 
I've thrown a lot of information at you. Uh, ANOVAs, ANOVAs from a regression perspective, ANOVAs from a regression perspective using dummy codes, ANOVAs from a regression perspective using dummy codes so you can interpret coefficients, and oh, by the way, here's some cool tricks you can do in Excel. <laughs> Maybe some not so cool tricks. Well, don't worry, this stuff isn't as hard as it maybe seems. Once you work with it a little bit, you'll totally get the hang of it. And with that in mind, here's a quick preview for the next class. Uh, we'll talk about interpreting those regression coefficients. I already talked about it a little bit in this lecture, but I'll kind of hit it again and show how you can plug in different values for dummy coded variables and you can interpret the coefficients uh, as, in, as a consequence of that. I'll also talk about contrast coding, a way of doing planned contrast that's a little bit different from dummy coding. It's not very different, but it's a little bit different and it has some advantages. All right, well, that's enough for right now. Thank you for your patience. And uh, hopefully uh, you learned a little bit and hopefully you have a little bit of time to sit and reflect on what you've learned. Uh, when you're ready, I'll be back with another video. So again, thanks so much for your attention. Bye-bye.